All right. Good morning, Ridge Point Church. How are you doing this morning? Good, man. I love the energy. Turn to the person next to you and say, I am glad to be here this morning. Now turn to the person on your other side and say, of course you are. You're sitting next to me. <laughs> and I also am glad that you're here this morning. Listen, today is obviously in our nation. Today is a big Sunday. There's this football game happening tonight that everyone gets really, really excited about. Even people that aren't passionate for a particular football team get excited. They get together and watch this, this game tonight. So I just want to know, random survey this morning at Ridgepoint Church, by, by show of vocal support, how many of you tonight are cheering for the New England Patriots? Now, how many of you tonight are cheering for the L.A. Rams? Now, how many of you are genuinely Ram fans? And how many of you are genuinely Patriot fans? Listen, they, we, we, there might be people cheering against the Patriots, but they have some loyal fans. That's all I'm saying. Everybody's like, I don't really care about the Rams at all, but I'm cheering against the Patriots. Like, I get that, but that, they're that way. Listen, I'm not a big Patriots fan, but I got mad respect. Nine Super Bowls in 18 years, like, they've done a, a tremendous job. So hopefully enjoy the game tonight. Uh, cheer for your team. Enjoy it. I'm excited. We're kicking off a brand new series here uh, this morning. I'm also excited because once football season ends, it means baseball season. Spring training is right around the corner, and we have decided this year at Ridge Point Church we're all going to be adoptive Cubs fans. <laughs> Go Kyle. That's right, man. We're excited about the Cubs this year. If you don't know why come see me, we'll be sharing for the Cubs. But listen, today we kick off a brand new series here. We're going to talk about this idea of worship. I got a chance this morning during the message to share a couple of things that are upcoming, I've not been able to talk about until right now, that are going to happen during this series. But before I get to that, I want to share this one final time uh, by way of talking about something we want to get to. But today's the last day we're going to talk about RPC Partnership. RPC Partnership is our version of membership here at Ridge Point Church. It's kind of a covenant partnership saying we are working together, signing up for a year, saying, man, for this year, I'm all in. I agree to partner with Ridge Point Church in some key areas. And so we don't talk about this throughout the year, except for during Discover RPC. But beginning of January, we begin to let people sign up and say, yes, I'm on board for Ridgepoint Church this year. Again, this is our version of, of what is typically, typically in churches, church membership. One thing I just want to mention, it says on the first box that you check that you're going to be a part of regular service here at Ridgepoint Church, but also involved in an RPC group. I want to talk about RPC groups for just a second before we get into the message because we have a couple of different ways for you to get plugged in. Uh, the first one is a traditional family group. And what, if you're not familiar with our family groups, what happens is uh, that beginning in a couple of weeks, some have continued to meet throughout the, the, the kind of the winter break, but beginning in a couple of weeks, our groups kick back up. And, and it's a chance for people to gather together at people's homes. A lot of times there's a meal involved. Uh, and you get together, you have a meal together, you fellowship together, you watch normally a video series and then discuss some of the things that you're learning as part of that process. Uh, we believe you can't do life alone. We talk about that a lot. And, and we think the best and easiest way to get plugged in is to get plugged into one of our regular groups. These are kind of just our family groups. It's a chance to gather together with about 10 other people and just kind of eat together and talk about what God's doing in your life. Uh, if you want to be a part of that and you haven't been, if maybe you want to switch groups that you're in, just fill out on your connection card, mark that you want to join a group, and Chris will get with you this week about that. But we also have a couple of other exciting things that we're launching that aren't traditional family groups. They're more just what we call RPC groups. And they'll take on some different views depending on what's happening throughout the year. Uh, but what we're launching right now is a couple of different studies, one for ladies, one for men. But the ladies study picks up, I believe it's February 22nd, uh, with, with this book. And I'm really excited about this. I wish I could be a part of this study. I'm so excited about this book. But Lisa Turkers wrote a book that it's not supposed to be this way. And so there's a, a lady study on this book, uh, incredible book. It's happening Friday mornings at 9 o'clock. We know that's not convenient for everybody. So if you can't be there, there's also an online option. Uh, Jenny Matthews is helping lead this. I think she's in here somewhere right here. Uh, so if you have any questions, see Jenny or just mark down your connection card that you'd like to be a part of this. I think it's a great study. I'm really excited about that. We're also starting something new for men. Uh, we're going to start a, a men's Bible study coming up in March. Uh, it's going to be an early Wednesday morning meeting at 6 a.m. Just 
We don't need a, a book. We're actually just going to be, if you have a hard copy of the Bible, I'd encourage you to bring that with you. 6 a.m., that way if you want to go and do whatever you have to do during the day, we're doing early in the morning. But to kick it off, we said we want to do something to get guys excited. Whether or not you're part of the study or not, coming up March 9th, we're going to have like a men's night out. We're going to get, get together with men in the church. Anybody is free to join this. But we're going to do two things. We're going to go out and eat some barbecue at Four Rivers, and then we're going to throw axes. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> like, 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 wait, what? You're throwing axes? There's this incredible place out in Tampa. Uh, this is Axe Throwing Tampa, and it's a cool place to go. They have kind of corporate things and different things. So we signed up March 9th at 8 o'clock for that. So we'll do dinner before that. We'll meet at 4.30 uh, for, for that night for all, for all the, the Axe Throwing portion of it. Uh, the cost is $45. It's a couple of hours there at Axe Throwing Tampa. So if you want to be part of that, we'll, si- we'll start sign-ups for that next week. But just a good chance for us to get together, kind of vision cast for the men. One of the things that we want to see happen this year is to see growth in all areas. So the, the women's study, the men's study, all that's going on in addition to obviously what we do on Sunday morning. So I'm really excited about that. But I'm also excited to talk about a series where we're talking about more than words. Now, if you grew up in my generation, if you heard the, the, the statement more than words, what was the first thing that came to mind? The song. Who was it? Extreme. Who said it? Justin. Justin. Of course Justin said it. He know that. Uh, man, extreme more than words. I tried to get the band to do it. Justin said, no way, we're not doing it. Uh, but, but the idea that as we launch into this topic of, of worship is that we know, like as, especially as we come into 2019, there's this, this new energy, this new excitement about what God is doing. And I love that excitement. I love that energy. I, I love just seeing people gather together to worship. But we also know that worship itself is, is way more than just the words that we say. In fact, I'm going to read scripture a little bit later that talks about that we can mutter words out loud and a worship could be vain if it's not matched with uh, hands that want to serve him. Our hands should be reaching out in worship, reaching up in worship as they reach out in service. And so today we're starting a four-week series with a little addendum to it that I'll talk about a little bit later. Two exciting things I get to share about this series in particular during the message. But watch this about worship. When it comes to worship, I think it's something that's ingrained in us when we're young. When we're young, we know what it means to get really, really excited about something. I know this by way of observation. You see, I've had a chance to grow up. I remember what life was like when I was five, six, seven years old. And there weren't so many cares and concerns in the world. I didn't have to worry about bills and and jobs and all those different things. And when it came to Saturday morning, there were certain things I was excited about. In particular, when I got into baseball, I got really excited about baseball. And I couldn't wait till Saturday morning because a lot of times Saturday morning meant for us going to games. And I'd get through the week, I'd get through school, all that stuff, and I'd wake up Saturday morning so, so excited, so passionate about whatever that day was going to bring. I knew that as a youth pastor, I'd see young kids, I'd see how excited they got about certain things. I I learned that all over again as a dad and learning it all over again as a dad of a four-year-old. Zach brings so much joy and energy into life that most people see them. They say, I wish I had his energy, but he has a passion about life that, that we know because we've all been there. That passion, that zeal for life tends to be corroded as we get older because life gets difficult. We get in our teenage years, which are normally hard years anyway, And our teenage years are often meant with eye-rolling and sarcasm. And that joy and that longing for life goes away, and now we're just sarcastic about life. And then we get a little bit older, and as we get older, maybe we have some bad events that take place. And that joy and that enthusiasm we have about life is replaced by hardcore cynicism. And it affects the way that we view life. And ultimately, on some level, it affects the way we view our relationship with God. You see, if we have some, some hard spots in life, if we, have some, if we go through some extreme tragedies, often what happens is even if we go to church, we say, man, I, I want to be here and I want to experience God, but, but all of my life experience is getting in the way of me feeling a freedom to be able to enjoy God and enjoy life. You see, when I was four years old, when I was five years old, I did both of those things. You see, if you teach your child when he's young, 
or when she's young, you teach your child about God and Jesus. There's a zeal about just learning about Jesus. There's a zeal about life that is replaced later on because of the hardships with a little bit of growing cynicism. And yet, as I approach the entirety of, of this book, as I, as I approach everything that we read in here, we see that worship isn't always easy, and it doesn't always look the same at all. You see, there's a lot, especially if we flip through the Old Testament, there's a lot about celebration of, of God that could be best described as jubilation. Man, there are times that they experienced God's presence, and, and because of that, they danced. And for a lot of us, especially if you grew up in a more traditional church, we would think, man, if anybody started dancing in church, I'd throw a Bible at them. <laughs> but there, there was this jubilation that they were just enjoying the experience and the presence of God. In fact, David, the king, dances before God in such a way that he almost becomes naked in dancing before God. And his wife looks at him and says that you've become undignified. You're a king. You're, you've become undignified. But he says, I'm so celebrating the presence of God in my life. If people started dancing so bad that they started getting almost naked in church, we'd really throw a Bible at them. But, 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 but the picture is, man, there was this, this celebration, this jubilation about experiencing God's presence. But there's also a scripture that talks about when life isn't easy, how we can still respond in worship. If you've ever read the book of Job, he experiences heartbreak after heartbreak. He experiences very, at the beginning of Job, he experiences the loss of all of his livestock. He owned a lot. He lost all of his livestock. He lost all of his servants. He even lost all of his children. And his response was this, in Job 121. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now Job was looked at by God as, as being blameless. He was... A person who kind of had it all together. And so he, in the midst of his struggle, in the midst of his grief, he says, listen, I don't like the lot that I'm in. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. But in the midst of my heartbreak, in the midst of my heartache, I'm going to respond by saying, blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, his celebration of God was going to look vastly different than David's celebration of God. It doesn't make one any more powerful than the other. And I want to get that as we launch into the series that we're going to all respond very differently. For some of us, we have a tendency to, to be a little bit more expressive in the way that we respond. I don't know if you've known this about us or not, but myself and Chris Neff, we have very different personalities. I don't know if you've picked that up or not. I tend to be a little bit more expressive than he is. And the thing is, is that if we try to be anything other than that, it's not authentic, it's not real. And above everything else, we want our worship to be real. And our worship should also respond to the situation that we're in. But if right now you're in the midst of one of those seasons where life is really hard and it's really difficult, our worship right now in the midst of our heartache and, and the stuff that we're going through can be just as real, can be just as sincere. And in those moments where we start to really experience God's presence, for the person who's very visibly and audibly expressive, and for the person who isn't, we can learn to have a response to God. You see, the one thing I read as I look at all of Scripture, and we're going to spend most of our time looking at one verse this morning, but as I look at the entirety of Scripture, is that when people experience the presence of God, when they actually experience the presence of God, the one thing that wasn't permissible is for that to be a passive experience. It was always going to be active. When, when they encountered God's presence, it was always going to lead to some sort of response. There was going to be something that took place in their life. There's sometimes that it was a visible response. A lot of times when people encountered the presence of God, literally they fell down and worshiped before him. When we sing songs, some people choose to, to raise their hands as a symbol of surrender and saying, God, I want to praise you for who you are and for what you're doing. The one thing that was never an option was for it to be a totally passive experience. So today we're going to launch out on, on the series on worship. We're going to talk about more than words and what that means and what, what that looks like. But I want to begin because the Bible also talks about the two worshipers worship God in spirit and truth. 
And so I want to begin by, by talking about this idea that if there's true worshipers, that means that there can also be false worshipers, that we can, sometimes there can be just an emotional response, and that in itself is just words, that there's not some substance attached to it, that if there's true worshipers, that on the other side there must be false worshipers. So how do we know? And I want to begin with the most foundational question to kick off this series, and that foundational question is this, what is Worship. See, when I think about a, a young child, I think about that, and maybe they don't view it that way, but maybe for me, when, when I was young, I worshiped baseball. I don't think that was the case, but, but I got excited about that. I was passionate about that. But what is worship? There's a bunch of great definitions, but about 20 years ago, I heard this definition, and I've tweaked it a little bit, but there's a pastor up in Atlanta. His name is Louis Giglio, and Louis Giglio gave this definition that I've tweaked a little bit. But his worship definition is this. Worship is our response to God, whether publicly or privately, for who he is and for what he's done. Now, 20 years ago, I heard a message where he used this definition. And as soon as I heard it, that definition stuck with me to the point that if people ask me today, 20 years later, this is what, when they ask, what, what do you think worship is? I use this definition. So I want us real quick, let's say this definition together. Ready? Worship is our response to God, whether publicly or privately, for who he is and for what he's done. So we're doing a four-week series. So it seemed pretty simple to me. If we're going to talk about worship, let's take this definition, break it up into its four parts, and talk about each of those parts. So today we're going to talk about the first one. Worship is our response to God. And when I talk about our response to God, it's saying it can't be a passive thing. That if, we, if we've actually encountered the presence of God in our life, now based upon our personalities, we might respond vastly differently, and that's entirely okay. But worship is, by definition, a response. In other words, it cannot be passive. I want to look at the verse we're going to lay as, as a foundation for this. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, it says this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Read that one more time. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Worship is a response, and the response is going to be vastly different based upon our personal, the way our character is, the way we're wired. It's going to be different based upon the set of circumstances we're going through. There's times that we encounter the presence of God that we're supposed to be expressive. There's times that we encounter some subtle truth in our life that we're meant to be contemplative. And both of those things can be worship. You see, sometimes we sit down in church and we think, man, I, I want to encounter God in that way. I see people worshiping, and, and I want to be able to respond that way. But, but for me, that feels like that's not my character, like that's, that's just not me. And, and, and maybe there's a, a learning curve that's involved in that. Maybe there isn't. But, but for some of us, just the way that God wired us is to be contemplative. To hear lyrics and to think, man, that's, that's who I, I am. That's, that's, I, I hear that, and that's exactly what I'm struggling with right now. That's, that's where I'm at in my life right now. And so I just want to take that in and soak that in. There's a word used in the book of Psalms. And the book of Psalms is mostly uh, songs and poems that are, run, uh, that are sung to God. And there's a word in the midst of many of the Psalms that just is the word selah. Sometimes you'll see it uh, over on the right-hand side of, of the text. And the word sila simply means to rest, to pause, and to contemplate what you just heard. So sometimes our response to worship is just to be contemplative, to, to, man, this is still a response. It isn't passive. But God, I've been wrestling with this. And as I wrestle with this, my first response is an inner response. As a matter of fact, as we look at this, we're going to have a tri-fold response. There's three different responses that we can have. But our first response is to have an inner response. You see, for people who are really, really emotional, and I put myself in, in that category, 
The tendency is to say, man, I, I want to be so outward in, in my response. I want people to be able to see that, that it hasn't come from a spot of being sincere. Jesus actually addresses that. In Mark chapter 7, verses 6 and 7, he says this. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Our worship should be sincere, and in order for that to happen, the first response is an inward response. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. See, the very beginning in Colossians chapter 3, the first passage, that, part of that passage we read, it talks about the inward response. Let the word of Christ dwell in me richly. That when we gather together, whether it's someone up on stage leading a song, whether it's someone that's reading scripture, whether it's someone that's speaking on that particular passage, the idea is that as soon as I hear what Christ is trying to communicate to me, as soon as I approach scripture, my first response should be an inward response. So this passage in Colossians, which by the way, the church there is dealing with a, a particular false teaching that was spreading, and they're saying, listen, we want to make sure that you grasp onto the truth. And so when truth is presented, sometimes people don't respond the way we expect them to respond in worship because they're contemplating the truth that they're experiencing. They're saying, man, I want to take all of this in so that when I go home later on, I'm still contemplating and meditating upon something that we just heard. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Meaning that whatever truth that we encounter, our first response is to be an inward response. Now, our definition, if we went back to the definition, the definition says our response to God. And the next part of that says whether publicly or privately. We don't have time to get into all of that today because we're going to deal with that next week. And I don't want to overlap those two topics. But let me share my first tidbit of information coming in this series that I'm really, really excited about. Uh, next week, as we get into the second part of that definition, I've actually asked Justin, our, our worship leader, to share the stage with me during the message. And so next week's message is going to be entirely different, and that's going to be a discussion where we're going to talk about worship in general, but in particular about that topic. What does it mean to have a personal time of worship? And how does that change when we gather together for corporate worship? You see, I'm convinced that if we could first figure out the first part of that equation, if we come into church on, on Sunday morning, and there's not been throughout the week this, this, man, I want to spend time with God, I'm excited about the time with God, then that doesn't translate real well to when we come into service. The personal worship affects the corporate worship. And so the more we start to figure that out, the more we say, man, I, I want my, my, my response to God not just to be something I do on Sunday mornings because I'm gathered together with some of my friends and some of my peers and, and some other people from my church I might not even be familiar with. I want my worship to be in when it's just me and God alone. And if I get that part of it right, then when there's the corporate worship of everyone together, my response is vastly different because it's come from a spot of me having had first an inward response to God. The second response is an outward response. An outward response that is both verbal. The passage that we read in Colossians chapter 3 says, Teaching and admonishing each other in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The idea behind that is that when we're singing these songs, it isn't just a song describing to God, though this part of it, the upward response is coming, a song to God about how much we love and adore him. But it's also through the teaching of the songs that we're singing. We're, we're saying things that are true. And the scripture says we're actually using that as a chance to talk to and to teach the people that are around us. That we're speaking truth. And that's why we don't just want to put fluff up in a song and say we just want to sing songs that just have a lot of fluff. But we want there to be some substance to the things that we sing. One of the songs we sang today said this. When sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Your holiness is Christ in me. And sometimes my fear is that we approach songs and, and we just kind of sing them because we see the words up on the screen. And honestly, it doesn't take a lot of uh, really internalizing the lyrics because I can just see a lyric and sing it without even thinking about what it is that I'm saying. 
when we approach God, if there's an inward response first, we take all that, we internalize it, we say, man, we just sang a song about the truth of who Jesus is and how Jesus changes us. About the, the level of how much I hurt and how much I desperately in, in, am in need of, of Jesus. Jesus, your holiness is Christ in me. But worship isn't just about music. There's a response that is a verbal response. It's an outward response that's a verbal response. But there's also an outward response. This is worship is more than just words. In Romans 12, verse 1, it says this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That literally, when, when we say, God, I want to give my body in service to you, that that is every bit as worshipful as us gathering together to sing songs. Now, I want to gather together to sing songs. I want to be passionate about that. And when we sing, there's an inward response, there's an outward response of teaching each other. But if our worship is going to be consistent, and so if our worship is going to be genuine and sincere, that it also responds not just in teaching each other through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, but also in our response to the people that are in need in our particular community. And whether it's here locally or globally, it's saying that when we gather together to do the things that Michael mentioned earlier today, when we gather together to work in the schools, or when we gather together to work for Habitat for Humanity, or we gather together to go to Honduras, that there is something incredibly worshipful about that. Because there's an inward response, there's an outward response that is both verbal and service oriented. And it's why when you ask people who've been through a particular experience of service in particular, that they would describe that season of their life as almost worshipful. There was something different about that experience that transcended anything else I've experienced. That's because it's part of our worship that we're surrendering our, our lives, we're surrendering our service to say, I want this to be used as my spiritual act of worship. Now, if we get one and two right, if we have there be a, an inward response and an outward response, then we can start to talk about the upward response. Our worship must be inward and outward before it's ever upward. If we do anything less than that, it's inconsistent. And Jesus would look at that and say, the worship's in vain. But once we've done those things, once we've done the third response that we have is an upward response. The last part of that talks about we're doing these things with thankfulness in your heart to God. And so throughout my week, I'm, I'm spending time saying, God, I want, I want to sit down and I want to get to know you. And so I'm sitting down and, and I'm, I'm studying and I'm saying, God, I, I really want to have in my life, I want there to be a depth to the things that I do. And there's an inward response first. Then when I gather together with other believers, there's an outward response. And I say, man, the things that I'm singing, I mean the things that I sing. And there's service to back up that I actually am legitimately believing these things. I say, first there's an inward response. And then there's the, the outward response. And now, only now, can there be an upward response that is consistent with everything that I've led up to, to that point. And the truth is, is that it doesn't mean that I have it all figured out. It doesn't mean that I've arrived and that all my problems have, have drastically gone away. But if throughout the week I say, God, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm struggling with cynicism because of these events in my life. But God, I want to know you more. And I go through those difficult conversations with, with God. I say, God, I don't like this lot of life that you've given me. And because of that, there's been this growing cynicism in my life that has to be checked. But God, I want to do those things right. And then I gather together and say, okay, I'm starting to figure this out. Now I want to serve other people. Man, now my faith starts to take on a vibrancy. There starts to be a liveliness to it. So that when I gather together, First of all, there's anticipation before I ever get here. I say, man, I can't, I can't wait 
to be together with other believers to respond upwardly because everything we've done all week long has been inward and outward and we gather together and our corporate response is going to be an upward response singing songs to God about how great he is. And it's not that I have it all figured out yet. Sometimes I don't. But my worship now is sincere. It's been genuine. And so because of that, I anticipate it. I long for it. I can't wait for that moment to get here. And all week long, I anticipate it. All week long, I say, man, I can't wait. It's Monday, six more days, and I get to do that again. Six more days, and there's anticipation that I get to get together with other people. They actually believe most of the same things I believe, except for the whole Patriots thing, but we'll forgive them. <laughs> they, 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 they believe most of the same things that I believe. They have some of the same passions that I have. We might come from incredibly different walks of life. We might have pursued different things through our years. But man, we're united together. When we unite together, there's freedom as we approach the throne of God. When that happens, see, I said at the beginning of this year, and some of y'all, you know, some of y'all probably thought I was crazy, but I said, I, here's, here's my big hairy goal for 2019. Is that 10, 10 a.m. at 100 Hatfield Road would be the most anticipated, exciting hour of the week for Auburndale and Winter Haven. Listen, we're just beginning. I love the freedom that we're experiencing, but this is just the ground level. Like, we're just getting this thing started. But it happens when there's been this, this focus in where they say, God, I want to fo- worship you inwardly. I want to worship you in the way that I respond to the world around me so that when we gather together, there's an anticipation and there's a liveliness to what we do. You see, my fear is this, and I've seen this. My fear is that for the longest time, there was this idea the church has been a place for people to come and just observe. We come in, and man, the band, they're really good. We come in, they sing really well, and listen, I don't sing well at all. I'll be the first to admit this. I don't sing well at all. And so what happens is we get this idea, well, I can come in, and I can just observe, and that's a passive, passive response. It's not a response at all. The church should be lively. In fact, I want you to get this. When the church is more lively on Sunday morning than the club is on Saturday night, we've arrived. When the church is more lively on Sunday morning, when there's more anticipation about what's going to take place on Sunday morning than there is on what takes place at the club on Saturday night, Then we've started to arrive. When the world looks and says, man, I don't know what's going on over there, but that place, they leave there and they're lively. I don't mean that all to sound sacrilegious. I just don't think that it is. In the intro to his book, Holy War, by the way, we have some resources that are available. We're trying to make this more available during series, so if you want to go deeper in some of these topics, one of the resources available back at our merch table is a book called Holy Roar. It's brand new. It's put out by Chris Tomlin. In that book, he quotes from uh, this, this Welsh theologian name is Martin Lloyd-Jones, and he said this, because sometimes you've been a part of churches where they don't want you to be excited. They don't want there to be enthusiasm. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, enthusiasm is one of the great, uh, dislike of enthusiasm is one of the greatest hindrances to revival. I've been part of churches where kids get really excited. And some of the other people are like, hey, y'all need to tone it down a little bit. I was at a, I was at a huge Christian concert one time, and, and I had a youth group that was really passionate. And we're at this concert, and our kids were standing up the whole concert long. It was an outdoor concert. The kids were standing up. They're getting into it. I had a lady come up. She tapped me on the shoulder. She's like, hey, I love how passionate your youth group is, but we can't see behind y'all. Could y'all sit down for the concert? And I mean, she was so nice. She was so loving about it. But I'm like, man, they're passionate. Why would you want to dampen that enthusiasm? Dislike of enthusiasm is one of the hindrances to revival. First year I was involved in ministry in general, I was asked to be the chaplain of a Christian school. 
the Christian school had a chapel every Wednesday morning, and, and it, was, it was more of a traditional chapel setting. We had a music minister, and he played on, on, on his piano, and, and, and it was every Wednesday morning he did that. And, and for him, it was, it was a lot of work on top of his regular uh, responsibilities and whatnot. And so a lot of Wednesdays he came in, and it was kind of the last thing on his mind, and he kind of put a couple songs together, and he led these high school, middle school and high school kids in worship. And I remember walking in as kind of the new chaplain trying to get the spiritual pulse for that group of students. And I remember watching just from the back that first year. And just I watched their response. And these kids from came, came from a, a very varied, d- diverse religious background. Uh, some came from more like a charismatic church background. And some of the kids were really into it. There were probably three or four. That were really into it. All the other kids sat down. There were three or four that would stand up and raise their hands. And, and I watched the other kids kind of mock them a little bit and make fun of them for, for what they were doing. And I started praying and said, God, there has to be a, a culture shift within this group of students. And it didn't happen overnight. But over the next couple of years, there's a group of students who said, man, I know on Wednesday mornings it feels very inauthentic, it's not real, but we want to begin to pray that, that God changes both what we're doing in that service itself, but also changes the heart of the students. So a group of students that wanted to see change, and didn't exactly know how that change was going to happen, but they began to pray and to say, man, let's, let's change the hearts of leadership, let's change the hearts of, of the students, and over time, Real, true, genuine worship started to happen. Why? Because a couple of people said, I want to come into chapel on Wednesday morning and not be bored to death. I want to come into chapel Wednesday morning and be excited, be enthusiastic, and I want to see God move. And we gather together to worship. Every time we gather together, we come together saying, God, if, if I've done my part throughout the week to individually worship you, And I've done my job throughout the week as best I can to outwardly worship you. Then when we gather together on Sunday morning as the church, we're gathering together now to upwardly focus our worship on who you are and what you're doing. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for passion and for enthusiasm. I thank you for our ability to respond to things that we genuinely care about. God, I was honest at the beginning of the message to say some of us, our relationship with you, it's a little bit awkward because of past hurts. We desire to know you better, but there's anguish, there's heartache that's in the way. God, I pray if there's someone who's struggling with that right now, that they can't experience freedom in their worship because of the hurts of their life. God, I pray your spirit would intervene right now and start to bring a healing, a fresh salve to their life. God, I pray above everything else that our response to you is sincere that what we say that we believe is matched first by our innermost reflections of you, then to the way that we serve our community locally and globally, the way we treat everybody we meet with dignity and respect. And then God, as we've done those two things well, to make sure our worship isn't in vain, that as we gather together corporately to know that our upward worship to you now is sincere, Because what we're doing on Sunday morning is reflected by who we are throughout the rest of the week. And that God, when we gather together as a church, who's been trying to live as consistently as we can throughout the week, that our worship is sincere, that it's heartfelt, and that it's responsive in a way that brings glory to you and you alone. It isn't just an emotional response, but it is an emotional response. God, let what we do here as genuine and sincere as it can be, reflect what we do in the streets out there. In Jesus' name we pray.